It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 13, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. I am so pleased today to welcome Bob Kennard to the show. Bob is one of the farmers that I think of as a first-generation visionary in the world of organic farming. For over three decades, he has been at the forefront of the local farming movement. Farming just north of San Francisco Bay at Greenstring Farm, Bob has a farming process that flies in the face of a lot of what I, at least, know to be true. That's no with finger quotes. His natural process farming system relies on sharing time, space, and resources with the weeds, insects, and other organisms that the rest of us consider problems, and using weeds, minerals, and native soil inoculants to encourage healthy plants that simply aren't bothered by these problem plants and critters. I think this is a real, I I was really challenged by this interview, Uh, really made me think, and it was also really inspired me to think about about how how we want to think about working with nature. I hope you enjoy it too. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by Vermont Compost, founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality composts and compost based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by Fertrell, a friend of nature since 1946. No matter your level of experience, Fertrell has the products and knowledge to help you grow healthy, natural plants and animals. Fertrell.com. Bob, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Hey, my pleasure, I'm sure. I'm really pleased that you could be here, be with us today. Um, I thought we'd start, I've, I've told the listeners just a little bit, you know, your your brief bio at the beginning of the show, but um, you grew up in the nursery business, right? How did you get from there to raising these super organic, supernatural vegetables? Um, well, that's a story. You know, I was um, born in, in Pennsylvania and... Um, in Lycoming County, and um, and so I had kind of puritanical background, and and um, all hard workers around, Splut and B running their dairy, and me getting paid a nickel to go up into the loft to throw the feed down during milking time, and and plenty of plenty of time to explore the woods and the pastures, and slaughter chickens, and all that kind of stuff, and then um. I went to first grade back there and second grade out here and third grade back there and fourth grade out here in Sonoma County. Um, and, uh, never, uh, never, um, got, uh, much farther to tell you the truth. I'm still here in Sonoma County and I have uh, five brothers and my father also a Bob Kennard. Um, he, he had graduated from Penn state in horticulture, although, much more of a salesman than a, than a plant person. Although, uh, he, he loved his plant material and so did his mother, whom unfortunately I never got to meet. passed away before my time. And, and, um, my father bought this a little retail nursery in Kenwood halfway between Santa Rosa and Sonoma. And, um, so from the fourth grade through high school, uh, we ran this little nursery and he was busy elsewhere. And I rather liked plants. I had some, uh, physical limitations in the brain and, and maybe normal youthfulness. I don't know, but, um, I like plants. They didn't bite and kick and all that. Kind of <laughs> My God, did we ever use a lot of, of, um, chemistry? We'll call it in those days. Um, we used to get DDT, 10% powder DDT and talc and, in, in uh, big cardboard drums. And it was one of my jobs to shovel it out and put it into one pound bags and weigh it and staple the little label thing, and close the bag up. And, and ladies had come in, old ladies had come into the nursery and they'd be complaining of ants and, and stuff like that. And, and so I'd be sent out and we, in those days we'd have 85% chlordane and malathion and glass gallon jugs. And so, I'd be put into the old lady's car and my, my hammer and a nail and a gallon of the pure stuff. And the thing was punch holes in the, in the little metal cap and crawl underneath the house, shaking the bottle up against the foundation to thwart the ant population. I think it grew more ants than, than it killed. Same with the DDT. We'd always be powdering the, the carpets and we had a little orange cat called Clancy and, and it, uh, always was loaded with fleas and that little tuft between the eyes above the nose and you'd scrape them out and they'd be filled right back up again. I'm out in the nursery spreading simazine and atrazine and in the propagation houses using using baliton and banrot, powerful fungicides. The whole 
the whole nine yards, you know, um, just soaked in the stuff. And, and, um, if I had any free time, which wasn't much, then I reverted to my childhood and wandered up into the surrounding hillsides. And I always had this, this curiosity as to why our soils were so crunchy and hard to walk on and cultivated grounds. And in the container nursery, we had to do so much applications of fertilizers and bug killers and so on and so forth. And another one of the bug killing projects about this time, every spring, we have these tent caterpillars that, that get in the oak trees and, and they're indigenous and, and, um, Sometimes they'd be getting in other people's elms and various things. And so I'd be out there spraying, spraying chlordane on them with the trombone sprayer and it'd be running down your arms and you'd be breathing it in, you know, you just got soaked with it. And this little hand pump sprayer. And I'd go up into the mountains and I'd see a, a few of those same kinds of critters. And, and they'd always be on low branches that had, were basically really old shaded out lower branches that not very important to the tree. And I watched those things and the, the, uh, critters would come out and they wouldn't spread over the whole tree. They just eat the leaves off that weak, sick branch. And, and, um, and the next year I observed that the branch had rotted and fallen off and I thought, yeah, there's something else going on here. And, and I'm great curiosity and studying of nature. And finally I, finished high school and because of parental influences, I squandered almost two years going to a, a land grant college here in California. And, and, um, they, I found they weren't interested in, in, um, in inquiry and curiosity. My big issue was this divergence between why a plants grew so well without any of these inputs within the natural structure. And we had to have them in the, in our structure. And one of the, I always, kind of interested in, in, in education. And so I read a lot always, and I spent a lot of time. I'm, I figured there must be complex organic molecular structure that was being transferred from cycle through the natural cycles through the, from the soil into the, into the existent higher plant life. And, um, and they always denied this and denied it. And one day I was in auditing, auditing a graduate class and, and I had this, it was a great professor, very professional, but he had in his mind that plants could only absorb simple, simple um, compounds in solution and, and um, no complex organic molecules. And one day he comes marching in and, and he was very excited. Many of our problems were solved, he claimed, and, and it was the introduction of the systemic fungicides. You know, you spray them on the ground, the plant sucks them up. And, and so I raised my, I raised my hand and, and hey, hey, is, this is obviously a complex organic molecule, and and that that was the end of my call of a collegiate career. <laughs> <laughs> Probably a, a a mutually desirable parting there. Well, well, maybe, and and um, so I I quit that, and because I knew the nursery industry, um, I had to make money. You know, I had exhausted my youthful savings, um, in that educational experience. And, and so I started a small retail nursery, which is still, which is still going. It's grown a lot. I, um, I sold it off to a, a good friend and after a few years and, and, um, I had done a, I, I'd been asked by one of my customers to do a little landscape renewal job. And so I went up to this property and it was, um, it was a pedigree Turkey farm. We had Nicholas turkeys here in Sonoma Valley where the broad breasted Turkey was, was developed through the, through late fifties, sixties and then this into the seventies. And, and, um, so there were 40,000 turkeys there. They'd been there for 40 years, uh, but the Davis, Phil and Muriel Davis were, were retiring from the business. And, and, um, so now there were more home bodies and they wanted their landscape renewed, which had been professionally, um, constructed originally very unusual. And, and well planted. And so it didn't need too much work. And so I traded that little landscape renewal job for the unoccupied, um, but herbicided and clean cultivated piece of ground of four five, six acres in their front yard. Muriel wouldn't let turkeys get any closer to the house than that. And right. <laughs> there's 40,000 birds cackling all the time. I can understand. And, and Phil was very clean and organized and, and, um, so I, I traded that and rented that piece of ground. It was ideal for me, very, um, on the, um, 
soil survey sortie index reading, um, it was uh, uh, the soils were in the in the mid twenties and um, in their productive holding nutrient holding exchange capacity, so on and so forth, and and um, and uh, the um, it had been really killed, you know, um, very deflocculated clay soils and lots of it washed away and and I. Um, no, 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 no organic nutrient cycling. And my goal was I just going to leave behind all of my, my history. And I'm going to, I sold my business and I have enough money to take care of my family, you know, two boys and, and their mom for a period of time. And, and I'm just going to come up here into this kind of isolated place. And, and, um, and from this foundation of, of nothing, I knew that if I did things that were positive for the um, vegetable plants that I was experimenting with, they would respond. And if I did something poorly, then, um, then th- that would also become quite evident and, um, and, and surrounded by, surrounded by the structure of nature of uh, forests, second, third, fourth growth forests, but, um, uh, mixed, mixed broad leaves and coniferous and, and, um, and so I did, that's what I studied. And I developed my thesis on natural process agriculture and, um, observed the, the foundations of it. And, and, um, meanwhile started teaching at the junior college and, and, uh, and, um, I did that for an excess of 20 years and, um, I grow vegetables, you know, I grow enough stuff, not a big farmer by any means. I really consider myself to be more of a gardener. Um, we, we specialize in diversity. Uh, I have, um, throughout the seasons, hundreds of different cropping cycles of absolutely everything in the books. We grow everything in this Mediterranean climate from all of the citruses, to av- all except limes. I don't do well with limes, but avocados and um, all, all of the temperate, normal temperate vegetables. And, and are you, are you able to grow year round there, right? Cause you're just North of San Francisco. Yep. Yep. We're, I, we, once the, once the first couple of years in this business, I, well, I better at least try to make a little bit of money, even though I'm already kind of all right. But so the only option we had still only had the standard pack and everything had to go through the brokers at the produce terminal. And, and those, those guys are, are professional businessmen and they aren't interested in the well being of, you know, they all say quality and it means a heavy box and a low price. And, and I, right. <laughs> I found that was a commodity stuff was not for me and all one crop at the time, you know, I grow, five or six acres of, of fall crop zucchinis or summer squashes and, and up in a fairly warm area, other rest. And we hadn't started this big ship them around the whole world business anymore. And all of the, all of the big restaurants and hotels had fixed menus and they need, needed zucchinis year in and year out. So the price would be really good, but I always got the short end of the stick and, and the farmer's markets got started and, and I, was right in on it and in here in Santa Rosa and, um, and never missed a, never missed a market in 11 years. And, and then a, a, a restaurant asked me to start growing for them. And I tried to do both for a short period, but really the restaurant client was, um, just what I wanted to do a, a big broad spectrum home garden that had the productive capacity. They, to, they serve about 500 people a day and, and, um, that's what I produce and a little of the herbs, the culinary herbs, the, 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 um, the decorative things, the flowers, the, the, all of the different seasonal vegetables. And yes, year in and year out, and I've never missed a load yet in my 40 some years of, of, um, providing fresh garden stock for the kitchens. So I, and and I think that's an interesting it's an interesting point now to come back to this idea that you mentioned about this natural processes agriculture and uh, you know because that's that's something that you're really known for and I remember when I worked on a farm out in California it's been it's been over twenty years now but your name had come up even at that time as being a as being a pioneer and being recognized for what you were for this this unique approach to growing that you've got. But I, I also understand that your relationship with this restaurant was, was kind of a model for this farm to table and back to farm system. Cause it wasn't just a one way flow, right? Yeah, no, we've been doing it for almost 30 years, I think. And, and, um, and it's, uh, they bring all their kitchen scrap compost up for, 
for my uh, vermiculture project, and and um, that that's uh, thoroughly digested. I let it take uh, let a two year natural cycle, and and it's inoculated. The worm barrels are inoculated with um, indigenous microfloral populations, of, um, and including the macropods, everything from the mountain forest everywhere. I take two little buckets up on the mountain and go underneath rotted logs and underneath all the different species of trees and plants and, and under moss and where they're growing on rocks, all those things and gather up small handfuls of, of from all of the environments and bring it back and inoculate these barrels, which then subsequently goes into my compost tea brewers, which, um, is, is diluted and irrigated through, um, through the system out onto all of the gardens, uh, pretty much every irrigation. And yeah, that, in, in the structure of nature, there really are only five, four primary food groups and that, that are responsible for, for the development of, of all life here on our planet. And, and the interface of digestion is really important. That's, um, that plants are carnivorous. They make lots of sugars. They pump those sugars into the soils and, and they grow the soil biology, bacteria, funguses, leaf, yeast, molds, and undoubtedly viruses, which we know very little about the soil, um, uh, just like we grow chickens. And, and then, then they, they, uh, they suck up their protoplasm and, and that biology goes out and dissolves and rots the rocks and, and organically fixes the, the mineral compounds, which are highly diverse into into organic forms and those become the catalysts of every enzymatic activity within the plant so we stimulate soil biology um, just as nature does naturally in the flood plain of bringing the the organic biological tea of the mountain to the swampy flood plains and re-inoculating it every year and and those things um, uh, the creek also brings the the mineral components, the rocks start big in the mountains, and by the time they tumble together and get to the ocean beach, it's predominantly silica, and all the softer elements are splayed out across the flood plain. But our creeks and rivers have been turned into drainage ditches, so I have to manufacture, artificially manufacture in the forced aerobic compost heat brewers, the biology, and then we take quickly cooled volcanic rock and crush it up to a fine powder, and it has approximately 80 different elements in it, but those quickly cooled things are held in thousands of different bonds. And, 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 um, those, those, it's just like, uh, absolutely essential twinkle crystal dust kind of it's, um, it's the plant is, if you have those two things, good digestion, you'll have a healthy plant, full spectrum mineralogy. So it plant can form and function all of its immunological and all of its processes to physical completeness and actually contain the nutrients that are required for, for good mammalian growth, healthy mammalian structure and, and, um, you know, full mineralization, very, very important. And then of course there's the compounds that of the four, the compounds that come out of the air. We have the two gases that come together called and form water, the electrolyte of life, and, and then we have the hydrogen and carbon, very, very important. And of course nitrogen. But if we grow cover crops to full maturity on and on our ground, so we have a lots of durable carbon. When I first started my soil organic matter content was less than one percent. Now in that garden it's over six percent. And so we have lots of Durable carbon, not a green manure. Green manures are high nitrogen. They rot away with a shorter than six-week half-life under most temperate conditions. But a mature, durable carbon has, has the plant's died of its own condition. You know, it's died of its own maturity, and, and its straw last, body part lasts more than a year in the soil. So when you're talking a mature cover crop, you're talking not 10% flower. You're talking something that's actually fully dry, mature grain heads on it, and that's what you're putting back into the soil. That's right. And that has a longer than one year half-life. And so you have a steady state, high carbon food supply, and you actually grow the soil and grow the soil organic material and grow the soil biology. And one of the strong, important elements of growing that high carbonaceous soil biology is that the night becomes a limiting factor. And, and subsequently, um, subsequently, the three living nitrogen-fixing microfloral population, both bacteria uh, populate and take advantage of that food source and break those hydrocarbon bonds, durable ones, and, and the carbon doesn't all break down in the course of one year. And, and so you actually have a residual, you, have this, this, you increase the organic matter content, really develop and grow the soil. So uh, that's very important. And, 
all of those hydrocarbon bonds are held together by the, the final one four element, and that's the sunlight energy. I like to call it the cosmic energy because we have more than just sunlight. We have sunlight that we know how the sunlight looks differently bouncing off the full moon a couple of yesterday. And, and, um, and so really, really important. We don't know too much about all of the wavelengths of light, how their material values uh, affect the growth of plants or even ourselves. So we have the digestion, the elements of, of mineralogy of rock, um, uh, the, the air foods, the carbon, the hydrogen, um, uh, uh, nitrogen and, 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 uh, and the sunlight energy. And so on my, on my most developed old home farm, um, t- typical annual application to grow a plethora of vegetables. Um, it all happens through the free living nitrogen fixing population. Um, I average use of, of about two pounds of actual nitrogen per acre per year. And none of it's directly applied to the fields. All of it is, is used as a biostimulant through the, uh, the forest aerobic tea brewers. So, um, uh, very, very, very low nitrogen inputs, and there you grow, you grow a well balanced plant. You dump a lot of nitrogen, like a, a street drug to kids, you know, for a plant. Um, they suck it all up, and then they have to suck up more water because the nitrogen is toxic. It needs to be diluted, and and um, and then they're a fat, weak plant, and the the commercial nitrogens and leachates also burn out soil organic matter and reduce the viability of, of the soil digestive microfloral population. And so then you get weak, sick plants. If you want to get, if you want to have bugs on your crops, why um, lump them up with nitrogen and sure you'll get, um, you'll get pests. We don't use, we don't look at bugs as, as a natural process farming business as, as, as pests. We look at them as indicators of plant health and there are always organisms out there they're really um, very beneficial to, necessary to the whole system they like on a zucchini plant let's say a summer squash plant they blossom as attractive yellow on a healthy one they they uh, blossoms open and close morning and evening and and the cucumber beetle or diabrotica gets to go and sleep protected in the reproductivity of the host plant and then in the morning it opens up and and the, they come out and they eat up the old leaves and poop them out and then it rains on them and that diabrotic manure tea goes into the soil at the right proportions and and the leaf is recycled and the plant gets nutrients through the agency of digestion of its of being its host of its friend the diabrotica and they never poop in the in the uh, blossoms and and um and we grow a diverse uh, a diverse system, always 50% um, of the total biomass for, for people, food for people, and 50% to sustain and grow the soil. And so between a row of summer squashes, there's like like suppressed mown weeds there. They'll come up and they'll get two, three feet tall, and then they're cut down with the scythe of the sickle bar mower or one device or another. And, and so there's like a thatch, and the root system holds and supports the soil, and stimulates the soil biological activity and, and there's, you can irrigate it or it can rain hard on it and there's no mud splashed under the fruit. So we, we don't have to wash the fruit and the blossoms are clean. And so we can, we sell lots of uh, squash blossoms and, and, um, and, and the cucumber beetles are just hang out and eat up the old leaves. They don't do a damn bit of harm to the, to the future, the reproductivity of the crop. So Bob, in my, in my experience and, and from what I well, at least what I think I know about about farming. I mean, when we're dealing with cucumber beetles here in Iowa or, or Minnesota or Wisconsin, we've got we have huge issues with the. It's not so much the cucumber beetle, but with the the diseases that they're vectoring, the the bacterial diseases and the viral diseases that they're carrying along with them. Um, it sounds like you're not concerned about that, or that that's not an issue for you. No, it's not. No, you know, you get you have minerally deficient, nutrient deficient plants, then they can't form and function their enzymatic traits. They can't live to their full intelligence. And so then they become vulnerable to viruses and, 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 and bacterial disorders. It's, it's no different than, than one of us. So if we could, we can solubilize the minerals out of our bodies by eating crap hollow food that doesn't have very many broad spectrum nutrients in it to first put with. And then, then we can start sucking down the tequila or something like that. And, and those powerful solvents solubilize minerals out of our system. And then we become subject to 
to the viral infection and bacterial problems. And, and just like a plant, you know, when you're sick, you're, you're sick. You're not doing very good work. And the, the plant's health through its digestion comes on the external from the soil, and, and ours comes on the internal through our digestive elementary canal, as they call it. No, those 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 problems are are really not an issue. It's, I grow a lot of grapevines for my partnership with Fred and Nancy Klein of Klein Cellars, and and um, a thousand acres of them. And everybody's worried about Pierce's disease and 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 um, and uh, uh, various things like that. And you type uh, and and um, hell, I took these vines over about twelve fifteen years ago, and they were they were infected for sure, and 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 commercially farmed, herbicided, and and fertilized, and all the normal all the normal agronomic stuff of the moment. And and the last fifteen years, they're very recovered. I still have a few plants out of the few million vines that we grow that are still haven't fully recovered from eutypha. But um, no, Pierce's is oh, those things are. They're just. We have this adversarial relationship with the structure of nature, and and um, and we have developed uh, uh, cultural practices from a long time ago when humanity first started in agriculture, and and <laughs> excuse me, we <clears throat> developed these processes of all, all for people and 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 nothing for nature, and but we lived in a different a different economy. You know, we had a small population and then a big planet, so you could take a, a little plot away from nature and push all the, kill everything else, keep all the competition, the weeds, everybody out and grow on that virgin soil for a number of years before it became tired and exhausted. And then, well, just abandon it and, and get a new piece of nature. And, and um, nature would take over the little plot quickly. And it might be a hundred years before humanity got back there to that plot to, to uh, cultivate it. But we have those same practices today all for people nothing for nature we try to kill all the weeds and 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 we um saw you put these soluble nutrients onto the the soil and 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 destabilize and burn out soil carbon destabilize soil biology so we have sick plants we have crappy digestion and and poor mineral nutrition and and that mineral nutrition is what forms and functions of the the systems, the immunological and everything else within the plant, and, and you'll grow a balanced, strong, healthy plant that isn't subject. It has its immune system. It's, it those viruses and, and bacterial blights and so on and so forth, as well as um, the consumption by, by vegetarian bugs of every imaginable sort in the soil and in the canopy are, are, um, uh, or, or the plant can protect itself from those things if, if if it has the if it has the environment to do so and it hasn't been the those qualities haven't been bred out of it a lot of so many of contemporary plants are are uh, been selected and selected for fruit qualities or or leaf qualities food qualities and and the the uh, the, the pepper is especially the sweet bell pepper is especially vulnerable and and it it's been selected to to grow this big heavy crop under high nitrogen systems and and um and the immunological stuff hasn't been hasn't been carried on because oh you just you know you just kill those bugs with some exogenously applied immunological poison and um and so it's uh if you use if you use good old fashioned um, open pollinated um, land race kinds of uh, vegetable seeds, um, you know, fruit and vegetable seeds, that's what we use. Then they've got their they've got all, all that old genetic coding right within them. So, and and your and in your environment, then in in your in your farming situation, that kind of that kind of variability and the qualities that those have those with those heirloom crops, those are working for you. Oh, absolutely. That's all. Basically, all we use uh, is, is, and they aren't necessarily heirloom types. You know, uh, are you going to, how old is the the common uh, black beauty eggplant, or or um, uh, um, you know, the Danvers carrot? You know, um, or the, the the Nance carrot. You know, they they aren't really heirloom types. They're just not. They they just haven't been selected like you get into a, a new variety of like I grow um, here in California the Yolo Wonder Bell pepper, which is from the 1900s, and and um, as when our culture first came to California, it was selected out 
being adapted well to warm, dry climate like this, and 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 it performs beautifully. And um, and and at the same time, it, it's uh, it has it has strong immunological response. Where if you go out and get some of these newer selected varieties, yeah, they might bear a little bit more, but um, you know, you might also have diluted out and, you, and bred out of it as not important to the. To the plant breeder, that's not the quality they were looking for. They were looking for thicker walled, heavier fruits, uh, and oftentimes um, um, not very much flavor in them. And so, uh, so that's um, those are the types that we use here. Okay, so I mean, it really is it really is a combination on your. I call it a whole systems approach. I mean, you're talking about having a combination of um, not just a not just a a farming or a, a, a cultural system of of tillage and weed control practices and mineralization practices, but you're also talking about combining that with the with the right genetics and and even to a certain extent the right kind of relationship with your customers, so that you've got this steady inflow of of biology coming back onto the farm. Yeah, that the the um, the compost back from the kitchen it, it's very important. Um, sociologically to, to learn how to recycle stuff, but quite frankly, the the organic matter volume is is just enough to feed the worms. You know, we get about 10 or 15 30-gallon garbage pails of kitchen waste, green kitchen waste um, every week, and and it adds up, and it's it's very nice to have that, but, but um, compared to the to the um, many tons of organic matter that is grown in a mature, durable cover crop in association with with human food um, cropping is yeah, that's that's it. Just is not a very big big volume there, but it does assist me through and carry uh, the evolution of the indigenous microfloral population from nature back into the agricultural soils. And are you importing other sources of orga- of organic matter, or is there everything else that you're bringing onto the farm? Mineral. Uh, yeah, no, just kitchen scraps. And, you know, if somebody has um, a waste stream product, like this old turkey farm, you know, it had all of its topsoil scraped away. Um, it was down to boulders. I used to I have this little this little trailer. It holds maybe two, three cubic yards. And, and it, at first, I'd be able to fill it up with big rocks in, in less than an hour and, and go use it as erosion control uh, in the creek lines plug up those creeks and start them. Uh, well, I've transformed the creeks from seasonal to year round on, on several farms. And, and, um, that's quite something here for the arid West. And, and, um, no, we, but you know, some, there was a horse lady, she needed to get rid of her, her bedding for a while. And so I had this one strip of ground that was used for the dead Turkey pits. It had been dug with the backhoe, big holes and well, really, really ruined soil. And, um, and so I, I would, I'd use that kind of material to, to overcome the deficiencies of that and build compost. It's like we make olive oil. And so I would get the olive oil pumice and, and, uh, but down at the down at the uh, bigger farms, down at the wineries and and whatnot, we have several thousand tons of annually of, of stems and skins and stuff from wine making, and always make compost from absolutely everything, and and um, it it really helps on that block of of sodic soils that I've got down there, a hundred and some acres, and and it goes out there, and we grow a cover crop on it as well, but um, it's a uh, it's always good to always good to take advantage of waste stream materials, but no, mostly it's on farm. We got to um, we import crushed rock to supplies that igneous rock, quickly cooled igneous rock contains every element on the planet. But um, sulfur is volatile, so it's a little bit low in sulfur as the the sulfur goes into gas form when heated, and so it escapes from the magma and forms up layers under in the in the mantle. And and so I'll use some gypsum and um, and then out here on, in Petaluma, right next to one of my farms, is a, we used to grow a lot of chickens here. And, and so there's an oyster shell crushing plant to provide shell bits for the chicken's craw. And, um, and uh, I have the shell flour, and I'll use calcium-bearing um, oyster shell flour to overcome calcium deficiencies. But that's, that's pretty much it. Bob, let me jump in here. We're going to take a second here to hear a word from our sponsors. 
The Farmer to Farmer podcast is sponsored by Vermont Compost. When you talk to Carl Hammer, the company founder, he'll remind you that potting soil is a set of promises about a product that has to do a really hard job, produce a healthy plant in a restricted media volume. When I started farming, I focused on the cheapest ingredients I could get so that I could make my own potting soil. But as my farm grew and as I saw the challenges that we were having getting great plants out of the greenhouse, I gave it a second look and I came to the fairly obvious conclusion that success in the greenhouse depends on the success of the plants that are growing there and that just like in the rest of farming especially organic farming that success rests on the stuff that the plant is growing in the cost of your potting soil isn't insignificant but it's a small cost relative to plant material heat and labor and if the media fails the rest of the enterprise is a sunk cost so get the media that works year after year after year and grow some great transplants vermontcompost.com The Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by Fertrell, a friend of nature since 1946. The oldest producer of organic fertilizers in the United States, Fertrell has developed a reputation for excellent quality and service, and not just in growing crops. Fertrell also offers a full line of support for livestock producers, providing customers with recommendations for base rations that can be blended with their line of NutriBalancers, which are a special blend of minerals, vitamins, and direct-fed microbials to keep your livestock both well-fed and well-bred. They can also custom blend minerals to meet your specific nutrition needs. In the same way that soil provides a foundation for plants, you need high-quality support for your livestock, whether that's dairy or beef cows, poultry, horses, or alpacas. I like that Fertrell isn't just a fertilizer company. They're drawing on a wider variety of knowledge and applying their principles in a broad context that provides ample opportunities to observe the the validity of their approach for trail better naturally for trail.com now back to the show with bob canard so on a on a practical level on your farm you're you're still practicing tillage you're not i mean you're not trying to bypass that from my understanding is that is that right i mean you're you're out there tilling you're sowing cover crops you're tilling in the cover crops um planting your planting your vegetables and then actually managing the competition from the from the weeds right yeah yeah that's that's exactly the case um yeah so i pra- definitely practice tillage we i use um i use uh chiseling to uh, depends on the conditions but um up to about 18 inches deep um um, once once I've got good biology, I don't need to chisel anymore because I don't have any more accumulated subsurface soil compaction. Um, I grow uh, lots of, of weeds between my crops that have deep root systems that recycle nutrients and feed soil biology and, and hold and support the deeper profiles of the soil and actually assist in development of the soil. And, and then on soil surface preparation, I'll have a standing cover crop of of um well let's see this year i used um uh, bell beans and and um peas and cayuse oats and and um and barley and um and vetch and in most of the one one mix has got to cover most of the ground there, there are variables too but over, no overwintered cover crop brought up by the rain and finishing right now and, and it'll stand six or more feet tall and 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 it's mowed down with a flail mower and and then it's incorporated with um discs or harrows or rototillers or it depends on the piece of ground and what we're going to plant there. So in some ways it's it's still it's something we would recognize as being an agricultural system. You're still it's not like you're just out there sticking carrot seeds in a in a patch of prairie. Uh you know if if you were um if you were a fortunate individual and and you didn't have to pay rent and you didn't have to pay your workers and so on and so forth. I guess you could practice um uh, growing plants in such a fashion, but um, I'm responsible for growing. Um, even now, I even have more probably grow a thousand vegetable meals a day. We have our direct farm store, and as well as the restaurant, and, and I have uh, about 40 employees. And uh, payroll is, uh, needs to be met every two weeks, man. And and we can't have an Easter egg hunt going around looking for potatoes. We have to have them in rows and, and deal to live within this economy that we've got. And so people need to eat and get good quality food. And that's what I try to grow. And, and I sell everything as economically as I can, especially at the store so that, that, um, that all of the economic stratas, if they recognize the need for high quality, uh, toxic free foods, uh, mineral dense, uh, um, nutrient dense foods, they can, um, they can afford them. 
and this is really interesting to me because I I worked predominantly on uh, very weed free farms. I mean, you know, and I've and I'm a big supporter of you know really you know control your weeds and clean fields and and so it's to me the idea that you're well, I worry about that I might have conniption fits if I walked into your fields. Um, but you're not just letting the weeds go. Can you can you tell me some about about how you're actually managing that competition? Uh, it's all about time space sharing. And so you start off and and at very first, um, the the uh, let's say that it's a transplanted patch of broccoli and cabbage brassicas of some sort like that. And you start off and it's clean and you have this little transplant plant out there. And, and um, then after it's irrigated or it gets rained on, uh, up comes at this time of year, up comes uh, a nice crop of amaranthus, maybe purslane, maybe another brassica. It depends on what, what the soil biology is at the moment, soil temperature and all that stuff. And, and no, then it, that needs to be suppressed. And so typically it'll be, uh, it'll be clean cultivated and, and different implements depending upon the scale. I'm right now down town Sonoma, one block off the plaza in my little urban garden of two acres that one young lady of 25 takes care of admirably. And, and, um, and it's, it's all, all freshly planted and basically clean cultivated. And there's a block of potatoes over there and, and she's just getting ready. It's, uh, the potatoes are about, Oh, a foot tall now and fully and fully foliated and, and she's just getting ready to plant a mixture of buckwheat and um, annual clover between them um, at their final cultivation. The seeds will either be drilled between the rows or broadcast at, at the final cultivation. And, and um, oh, there's, a, there's a little patch of corn over there, and, and um, the corn already is about 18 inches tall, and, and um, already underneath it is, is a, a full planting of vetch um, that uh, completely um, established broadcast and incorporated in, into it the final corporation the vet seed small it put about two pounds three pounds to the acre out there and and cultivated in and um and and um so it's the grounds co- grounds all covered up with vetch and corn plants are well in advance of the vetch and the corn's pretty soon going to take dominance of all the sunlight and the vetch is shaded out down in there and, and this happens to be sweet corn but it doesn't matter what kind of corn it is and, and and then we're going to be walking on the on that on that cover crop of vetch and stomping on it for harvest and and um, or running our machinery over it if it happens to be down in the swamp where we're growing our wheat and barley and then the combines will be driving over it the clovers and the vetch will be smashed down but as soon as the crops harvested the corn or the barley wheat any of those things then the, the there's still plenty of growing season and the vetch explodes into growth and. So I can grow a beautiful crop of sweet corn with no more than two pounds of actual nitrogen per acre. And, and um, uh, there's a lot of, 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 of um, commodity corn being grown that uses in excess of 200 pounds of actual nitrogen per acre applications. And, and it, the plant uses some of it, but most of it is evaporated and volatilized back into the atmosphere or leached into the water table or eroded off and um, ends up in, ends up in the, in the, floodwaters and it's toxic you know that here are san joaquin valley in san in california almost all of the groundwater has way too much nitrites in it to, to be uh, potable again it's not like just planting you're not sticking the broccoli plant out there and letting it fend for itself you're you're controlling weeds around it you're putting in you're adding cover crops but you're also as i understand it letting some weeds grow in between those rows right oh, you're I- not or whether they're weeds or they're planted selected weeds doesn't make any difference. We do both, but um, amaranthus, summer amaranthus is a good, a good natural uh, um, established weed. Um, but it, it might be a ro- broccoli that's planted with um, with uh, Japanese buckwheat, let's say, and, and so there's a row of broccoli, and they're about um, thirty thirty two inches apart, and then there's two rows of buckwheat that are planted between it, and and the buckwheat. Um, is it's all a matter of time space sharing and then the buckwheat grows up and and you no longer have a monoculture but you have a culture that has a companionship between its mixture of crops and and um there might be in any cover cropping system as many as eight or ten fifteen different um different plants the first ones that come up are the little nurse crops like annual bluegrass and out here the little wild calendula and fillery and and, and maybe borage and and um, then 
up from them come longer standing, higher proteinaceous plants, like maybe the mustard's an excellent companion plant for the broccoli. And, and, and then up from them come the, come, come the higher proteinaceous, longer to come, um, um, broad, uh, uh, high protein grasses like the wheat and the barley and, and, uh, and the oats. And, and after that, finally come the long standing, late blooming, climbing things like peas and bell beans and vetches and clovers, you know, mixtures of best and no it's about our time space sharing and the broccoli and in this climate we harvest uh, i i plant old-fashioned um open pollinated broccoli varieties like waltham and um a crop of broccoli will be able to be harvested for a nine-month period of time and and so you're walking back and forth and stepping on those inner row plants and if they get too big then out comes the little sickle bar mower or the scythe or or, or the little string um, cutter or one of my other devices, and, and the, the weed population is suppressed. It's cut back. And, and, um, and so then it, its root systems go into, into dormancy as well, and, and now its main stem top has been cut off, and it comes back with internalized competition. So instead of having one main shoot, it now has three or four, and um, it doesn't have the capacity to reach um, um, apical dominance anymore and over override the broccoli plant. You know, it's, um, it's, it's a combination. I am perfectly happy with a, a 75% theoretical gross yield of, of human um, foods. At the same time, I grow a 75% um, organic matter yield to uh, feed my soils. And so I have two 75s or for that cropping cycle, 150% theoretical gross yield, half for now and half for the soil for later. And um, we, then we don't have the expenses of, uh, we have a healthy system. We don't have the expenses of, of um, killing bugs and immunological stuff, which in general agriculture runs at least 20% under most, many conditions um, of cost inputs. And, and, and we don't have nitrogen costs, which is another big one because we have high carbon in the soil and we don't need to apply, but just a very trace amount of nitrogen because we have the free living organisms doing that job for us. You know, our air is 72% nitrogen, and and um, these organisms have, have grown up and designed. That's how come. The, that's how the forests live. That's how the pastures live. That aren't aren't under man's heavy hand. And again, in this in this setting, you're saying that you're not getting uh, you the the cucumber beetles aren't having a bad effect. Are you dealing with things like you mentioned sweet corn? So I mean, I when I think sweet corn, I think earworms. Um, you're not. I mean, how how are you how are you managing things like earworms, things like flea beetles, and that, or are those just because I know that that I mean the restaurants that you're dealing with are not it's not like they're they're serving uh, arugula that's full of holes. Nope, that's true. They're picky about that. Um, uh, corn earworms associated one with genetics and two with environment. First off, good old fashioned genetics with tight wrapper leaves right to the tip. The bug can't get in. Um, many of our contemporary cultivars have that's been bred away from them and, and, and they've gone to, to many, many more rows of kernels and, and a bigger cob that pokes actually pokes out no wrapper leaves basically on the tip at all. And, um, so very, very vulnerable genetics are part of it, but environment's another part of it. But even the good old fashioned corn, it can't, it can't, uh, uh grow good wrapper leaves and good immunological defense mechanisms a tight tip that you can barely rip open with your fingernails um, unless it has good digestion and good mineral nutrients, of well-balanced um, living soil to arise from. Same thing with, uh, you mentioned flea beetles. Here I'm looking at a block of, of rocket or arugula that I don't see any holes in it at all. Um, a bright, dark color, um, a beautiful posture and to the leaves, an excellent snappy taste. I can't taste one right now and talk at the same time, but, but, um, and, and here it's, it's hot and, 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 um, so the rocket in the summertime, I try to grow it under, under the, it's on the kind of the edge of the forest where it gets some, some afternoon shade. It gets too hot for it. It'll go into a wilt and, and, um, and then it will be vulnerable to, uh, the flea beetle population. And between each row of rocket is just sprouting up a little bit of a little bit of of, of um, crimson clover. As the rockets pick, the clover will reassert itself. Wow! What's amazing to me hearing you talk, Bob, is is just how, I guess, how observational you are. How much your 
noticing everything. And you talk about, you talk even about like the arugula having good posture. That's really important. We have thousands of texts on all sorts of organism health. And, and I never have found a single textbook on comprehensive textbook on plant health characteristics. You know, like when you go into the nursery and, and you buy a, a transplant, let's say a tomato seedling, and it's grown in, in some sort of lightweight, um, man-constructed media, and, and uh, it doesn't, it's fertilized with commercial fertilizers. Those plants have two kinds of roots. They have establishment or seeking roots, and, and that root runs to the bottom of that pot, and it knows that what it needs to achieve its reproductive potential is not in that little pot, so it keeps with seeking. It sends one root around and around on the bottom of the pot. It's a long, stringy, seeking root trying to get out, just like the tiger in the cage. And yet if you grow that tomato transplant in, in a broadly inoculated, biologically sound, compost-bearing, living soil, it sends its establishment root to the bottom of the pot, and it hits the bottom, and, well, this is the bottom for now, and I went through I went through all of this good stuff, and it develops a very finely branched root system, and it holds on to all of that, that living soil, and it is a strong, healthy guy. What I'm struck by here is, is I mean, I, I've spent 25 years in, in farming. Um, you know, I spent plenty of time out in the field. I spent, you know, I've, I've worked on a lot of different operations. I've worked in a lot of different climates, but I have a feeling that you would come onto a farm that I was running and you would see an entire, you'd see an entirely different story than what I'm seeing. And I'm, I'm interested in, in how you, how you developed or how you encourage your, your interns at the, at the green string farm there to, to develop those powers of observation. Uh, well, first off, we have to learn how to pay attention. Paying attention is the number one thing, you know, um, it's, it's, uh, you got to look at it, you know, uh, uh, you go out and try to pull a weed and, 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 and it's going to, it grew there of its own volition, and so it has great anchorage. It's hard to pull that that dock. You can't pull a dock plant or a malva out. I mean, you'll break your back trying to do it. You know, if it's a big, right. Um, and 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 uh, yet your little plant, its transplant with with the genetic material that it's given up a lot of its wildness, is it will slip right out of the ground. If you grow a a, a, even a cabbage plant or a kale or a broccoli, something like this, that is really likes its location, it's also damn hard to pull out. Um, I, I, you go out and try to pull out one of my artichoke plants, <laughs> good luck, good luck. Um, even a, even a, a strong-rooted kale, I'll go out with those students and, and we're out into a patch of kale transplants, and there might be a few acres there so I can sacrifice one. And many, many students can't pull one out but just because of the nutritional soundness. It likes its life. And anchorage is very important. Fibrous root systems, you get a leak plant. And, and we have to dig our leaks with a, with a, sh- a shovel or I'll get the tractor out if it's a big enough harvest crop, it's cycle, and, and, and plow them out. And um, massive root systems and, and holding on to the soil. You know, they're, um, and then... And then um, solid, meated, and fleshy, like we grow leeks that'll be grown in a total broadcast. Leeks are established, clean, cultivated, and and once they're established, they're maybe a foot tall or something like that, and their final cultivation, I'll put a seed broadcaster on, on front of the tractor if it's a big enough patch, or do it by hand if it's a small patch, and, and um, broadcast a mixture of different um, weeds, cover crop plants, nature support plants over the entire ground and on the back of the tractor or whatever, cultivate those seeds in. And, and then the ground's all covered up with vegetation. And then that forces the leek to, to grow upright. And all the plants are growing upright. And you look at a patch in, in August, let's say, and it doesn't look like there's, like there's any, uh, any leeks out there because they're all summer annual weeds. And and the leaf stems have been forced to grow long, and they've been shaded by all of this cropping, this intercropping business. And, and so they're blanched white, and they're maybe 18 inches tall with a blanched, straight blanched white stalk like King Schlieg or, or, or King Richard, two nice leeks that we use, old kind of old ones. And, and um, subsequently, the winter frost comes along and kills the amaranthus and the other summer cover crop plants down and and look, you're looking at a nice bed of straw 
over the whole ground with clean leaf leaves, no mud splashed up. So they go to the kitchen and you typically a leaf has, has to be split from top to bottom to wash the dirt out of all of the wrapper leaves. And our, our leaves don't have any dirt in them because there's no mud to splash. Because the ground's all covered up. I'm just thinking what an incredible, I mean, when I hear you talk about doing that to your leek crop, um, what an incredible leap of faith that is to say, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to let go of some of this control here. I, I, I think I, I would have so many sleepless nights. I, I, you know, I just, I can't imagine. How do you, how do you, how do you get to the point where you know that this is the thing to do and that this thing is going to work when you're so far outside of the dominant agricultural paradigm? Well, I, I, I um, left go of the dominant paradigm when I left the nursery industry and I needed to be open-minded. And my first five years, I, though I had in the nursery business many employees, I, I did everything myself to uh, observe it in a small scale so I wasn't um, economically going to be economically challenged. And, and I grow a lot of diversity, so if, if I lose something, I'm always backed up. I have... Um, um, here I'm looking at at this part of this garden. I have um, around the perimeter. I have avocados and citrus on the fence lines, and, and then there's a block of strawberries, and there's a block of brise, and there's a block of all small because it's all on two acres. This little plot. Um, there, there's a block of fava beans, and and there's some t- uh, 20 rows of cat soy, and another little section of broadleaf endive, and and the parsley just coming up, and. Um, there's some little bit of open ground and there's the corn and there's the potatoes. There's a little section of chives. And one thing you mentioned, um, competition wise, you said you grew, um, clam shelled, uh, um, herbs at one point in your life and little, right. little perennial decumbent or I grow a lot of herbs. We have the thyme, the sage, the savory, the chives, uh, the lemon verbena, um, anise hyssop, you name it. Uh, we produce it. In, in small lots, uh, we don't need large quantities, but, um, you know, it's still about 10 per- herbs are about 10% of the business, very important consideration. And, and they're decumbent little plants, and, and those systems, those, many of those systems need to be maintained um, competition-free. And so those, those small areas are, are supported like the chives. I have this beautiful Zelkova tree in this, on this little property, and it's, it's, it's fall drop leaves are mulched over the, the chive bed and they're standing strong and beautiful right now. Um, lettuces that are, that are small and, and quick cycle, uh, and, and get uh, grassy. I'll call it if they have too many, too much competition They're they're grown to about half maturity before the cover crop plants are introduced or allowed to take off if they're already seeds are already present. So, you no, know, there's lot, lots of lots of variables. That, um, you know, we've got if, if humanity is going to survive here on on planet Earth, we've got to learn how to grow the soil while we grow people. And and um, m- my curiosity and my interest in, in in growing human consciousness and understanding of the soils, my educational fortitude is far more important to me than than my uh, economic gainfulness. Um, you know they. The, I know I can't carry anything to the next world in my purse, but um, I can leave a, a little bit of consciousness of understanding of nature behind. So that's more what my life's been dedicated to. And I've always paid my bills. I've never bounced a check. I'm, I'm, I've, I'm always maintained solvency and, and pay all my workers and, and a very a reasonable rate, I'll tell you. And, um, uh, pay cash for my equipment. I'm a little bit of an oddball like that. I don't, if I need a new tractor, I don't get it until I can write the check for it. And again, you're, you've made a, a number of references today to, to the two acre plot where you're, where you happen to be on the phone with me, but that's not the only farm that you're farming. Oh, no, no, this is a little play student play baby farm. Miriam's taking care of it. She's a, I think she's a 29 year old gal. And, and she came here from, from a, a philosophy background and, and, um, and she's, it's taken me a few years, but she's, she works with, with, um, uh, up at old home farm uh, for a couple of years. And now she's down here the last 18 months and this one's turned over. So she has her own project and, and, um, her own sense of responsibility. And 
she, pretty soon she'll be moving off to her, her own little um, local food producing oper- opportunity someplace here in the nation. Um, but yeah, no, we have, I have old home farm is 25 acres of mixed fruit and vegetables. We grow up there, everything from apricots to avocados and all, all the all apples, everything up there. You know, not a lot. There's about 2,000 fruit bearing trees on that property, interplanted in and amongst and with um, in the blocks of vegetable plants. And and um, and uh, Carrie, a five year old student, runs that farm right now, along with um, she has three other employees and um, maybe four. I'd have to go back. She may have added one more. Um, and then there's Mission Garden, which is a little a little educational garden for um, fourth grade students. And it's about small, it's half an acre. And then there's the swamp, which is 140 some acres. And that's planted to 20 acres of, of vegetables. I'll do fall harvest uh, um, uh, beets and carrots and broccoli there on about 20 acres. And the balance of it is in, in bar, mostly in barley for the brewery. That's part of the company and, and um, old, old fashioned two row barley and, and um, and then about uh, ten acres or something like that of of um, old uh, um, uh, two chromosome wheat, uh, very low gluten uh, type, um, and and we use that for our bread making business and through the store for people buy the flour, they mill it fresh and use the flour there, and and um, then there's the the Glen Ellen farm that's, that is focused on cider apples and medicinal herbs. And, and, um, then there's a little citrus, uh, place. It's about six acres, things in citrus, a hillside place. Um, that pretty much sums it up. (laughs) Is, Is that all? You know, there's a couple more, but um, okay. <laughs> I mean, that's a that's a lot to keep your keep your head wrapped around. Well, you know, um, I, oh, I forgot to tell you about the Green String Farm. That's a hundred and some acres, and and it was about forty fifty acres is 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 um, run by one of my old students, an admirable fella, uh, Riley, and um, and he has a, about six or eight employees there, and that's where the store is, and and they're putting out about, oh, what was that? He said 250. He's putting about 25, 30,000 tomato plants in today. And they're, they're on um, three by seven foot spacings and, and, and they're um, grown, just grown right on the ground. And, and um, we average about 15 tons of fruit to the acre. We can't pick them all, tell you the truth. They're all fresh, fresh, truly vine ripe and fresh market fruit. Until they're ready to pick, they aren't harvested. We don't pick them at any any packer shipper stage. Every we don't. I don't use refrigeration. Everything goes out fresh. The only refrigeration I use is for for the meat and and dairy products that uh, that we generate. Have to use it there. But vegetables are non no no vegetable refrigeration in my business. It, I think it deteriorates the product. Of course, in in the big world. You can't be such a purist, but I've managed to hold on to that one. Nice. And and you mentioned the meat products and and where can you just real briefly how the livestock fits into your operation? Well, livestock is um is often another big farm that I don't have any direct management of except the management of the rotational grazing of the uh, of, of the livestock. It's a, a big, big piece of acreage, most of it mountain ground. But then we have three or 400 acres down there that, that we grow forage on it. And, and um, they, I have Dexter, Dexter beeves and, and a small, a small um, framed animal, um, very, very hardy old genetics and uh, good birthing characteristics, uh, very, very um, happy being browsers as well as, as grazers. Um, um, and uh, they they take a little longer to grow. And my herdsman's always after me, wants me to switch them out or breed something else into them. But so far, I've held the line on that one. And and um, so they take about steer takes about two and a half years instead of two years to, to come out to size. And then, and then they're smaller too. They'll they'll hang out at about eight hundred pounds instead of twelve hundred pounds, like a beef master or something like that. And and um, and so they're, uh, the economy's a little different, but boy, the meat's fine grained and, and 
not excessively larded and and the the veining is all crystal white and they're they're grown in in they're free free range rotational free range guys and and um they move them from the goats the sheep and the and the steers or um the the whole flock there they're they're in mixed herd and they they are moved from paddock to paddock for um, you know, every two or three days, they eat the pastures down if they're on pasture to about eight inches or something like that, and they're pulled out and they spit on all that grass and it grows right back quickly and and so they have lots of places to go and um, very very clean high quality stuff and you know, my my taste buds and my customers as well very, and very much in line with the philosophy of your farm yeah very much so yeah and um. And so, no, I can't, uh, the uh, only interaction, um, interface between the, uh, the, the, um, mammals and the, and the gardens I use, I use, there's about 5,000 head of sheep and goats, mixed sheep and goats and, and, um, a thousand acres of, of, uh, pine cellars, uh, grapevines and, and throughout the winter, as soon as the harvest is done, the grape harvest is done, then the cover crops are planted and soon it rains on it. And now I've got good pasture underneath there and the goats and sheep all winter long are rotationally grazed about 500 head on two or three, four acres or usually one day, sometimes two days. And, and then they're moved. And usually we can get three get grazing rotations under the vines before they bud out in the springtime. And then we have to pull the animals out and put them on the open ground. And um, this year is exceptionally good. We had good good rainfall this year. Last year was really difficult. Actually, had to buy feed last year. That was that's how that's how livestock goes. <laughs> As I mentioned when we were when we were talking about doing this interview, I've got I've got three questions we like to ask everybody on the that comes on to the show. Um, so. As as we're kind of moving towards wrapping up, then what what's your favorite tool on the farm? If you if you had to pick one, well, as I said, I'm more of a gardener, and and so I'd probably say the wheel hoe. And do you have a particular wheel hoe that you that you really like? Well, we use the they're totally modeled after. I have dozens of them, and they're totally modeled after their their total knockoffs of the old Planet Junior wheel hoes, both the high wheel hoe and the and the small wheel hoe, and and of course, we use all the different blades on them, like that broccoli you, that we talked about. You need to you have an acre of it, let's say, and um, or cabbage or something like that. And you need to suppress all of the weeds right underneath the the row of plants, so you have control of competition. And so I'll put on the, get a high wheel hoe out with a little plow blade and hill them up just as those weeds have. They uh, germinated, and it can be cloaked red with amaranthus cotyledons. They've just germinated, and they've exhausted their energy. They haven't uh, no mature leaves yet. You just bury them once, and that job's done. And then you leave the, the inner row space filled with the amaranthus, and and um, that inner row space filled with amaranthus tells it has allotropic essences to it, and it tells all the other weeds underneath the broccoli don't germinate again. And, and one cultivation usually does it if they've gotten the timing down right. And uh, no, the wheel hoe on small acreages is really good. The um, the wire weeders on the tractors are very very useful in the grains and 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 in transplant vegetables as well. Um, to, or direct sown stuff like carrots. Wire wire um, weeders will go over it. Uh, the leaf. My my least favorite is the hand hoe, although I have a nice collection of them, and we use those. <laughs> I think you always you always have to be prepared to go with that. I don't I don't think you can get out of get out of the hand hoe. At, at, so. at, at cultivation tools, you know, maybe maybe I'd be more impressed with uh, um, happier to say my uh, forced aerobic compost tea brewing systems. Um, that's so so critical, but. Uh, it falls into a different category. And and if you had to if you had to choose one thing, what would be your? And you said how many crops do you have growing on your farm? Oh well, uh, maybe this year fifty varieties of tomatoes, um, and and four or four plantings this year. Um, we'll have tomatoes from the first of June usually until almost Christmas time, um, with the late planted small fruited. Um, uh, thick skinned types that can take a little bit more cold weather and, and uh, um, hold up against rainfall and things like that. Um, uh, I, I'd have, I don't count it like that. You know, we probably 
35, 40 different herbs that we grow and, and, um, and, and every vegetable in the book. So out of all of those, if, if, if you had to pick a favorite, what would, what would your favorite be? I couldn't do that. I can't answer that question other than just <laughs> diversity. Favorite. I have a very short attention span. I like to do lots of little things. I, I, I earlier in this conference, the prince we talked about my first couple of years, just growing commercial marketplace zucchinis all day long, picking zucchinis, most of the evening, packing them most of the night, driving them to the produce term. And the only thing I would see in my eyesight were zucchinis floating by in my dreams. No, that's not for me. And if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would that be? Um, pay closer attention to nature. Look deeper into the primary teacher. She's naked. She doesn't have any deception. Look right into her eyes. Look at the posture, the color, the texture, the anchorage, the 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 the, the symmetry. Absolutely everything. Use every common sensory device. Look, taste, um, um, feel, the mouth feel, the taste, the smell. Use your common senses to uh, to direct you towards uh, towards towards your your solutions. Um, you can have a sick week plant. What an opportunity! Um, uh, go and and feed it by the foundation materials and observe the results. Many many times, I have gophers eating on some broccoli's and apply a little bit of about I don't know thirty fifty pounds to the acre of crushed oyster shell bearing calcium and and two three days later the plants manufacture something within them that the gophers no longer find tasty and and predation stops. Uh, you put a little handful of, of highly energized um, compost from from the worm bins and all that indigenous microflora population and water it in a little bit, just on a couple of plants, and come back at the next morning with your pen knife and, and scarf the soil from, from the base there to into the field, leachate field of the compost tea and um, see new little white roots growing up into that into that solution. Well, you know, you're bringing the right stuff. Pay attention to nature. And, and um, I, I, don't, I think I've been doing that. That's what I wanted to do. That's why I went to college to satisfy my curiosity and, and didn't find it there. So I found it in nature. Just pay attention. Bob, I've really enjoyed our conversation today. Thank you so much. You're most welcome. This has been great. If people want to learn more about Green String Farm and the Green String Institute, where would they go to do that? Uh, greenstringfarm.com institute.org. Okay. Okay. And is there, um, are, are there other resources about, about your work and your approach to farming that if, if somebody was interested in figuring out how they could start to apply some of the principles that you're talking about on their own operation, is this, is there something, a, a written summary? I don't think you've written any books or anything. I'm kind of illiterate, but, um, um, I can talk. <laughs> I, I talk and I can read, but writing is a difficult thing for me. I have great script, but uh, actually conjuncting words without making run-on sentences and things, that's difficult. Um, no, I'd recommend um, um, that when I started in this business, um, the only the only uh, like common public literature was Rodale's um, uh, Organic Gardening Book, which was didn't offer too much in those days, um, though they continue to they continue to contribute. Um, but is uh, is arisen in the last thirty years is is publication Acres USA. Um, they have a great publishing house and excellent monthly magazine that that talks about uh, uh, many of these things: the mineralization elements, the the rotational grazing elements, the intercropping potential of of growing. You know they're. Uh, you're, you're not necessarily in corn country, but if you went to corn country, let's say Ohio, you learned how to grow a, a, a cover crop underneath on your went ditch this Roundup Ready stuff and, and or the herbicide business and went back to cultivating your corn and you have to cultivate your corn two, three times. And on your final cultivation, mount a, mount a seed broadcaster on the front of your tractor and broadcast some vetch or some other appropriate for your region, um, non-competitive nature support plant underneath there. And the corn's big, it's shaded out, it's non-competing, but the vetch will grow, it'll, it'll get going. And then along comes the harvester and at the end of the season, and they're still growing 
time out there and the vetch explodes in growth because now it has all the sunlight and everything it needs. And so you incorporate a good organic nitrogen fixing organic cover crop underneath your corn, take advantage of those post harvest fall weeks or a couple months sometimes um, to hold and support the soil over the winter. Then the snow comes and the vetch is is frosted down, but it has its crown, it lives, and, and then the sun comes back in the spring and starts melting the snow down, and, and the little vetch there growing up even underneath the snow cover, and then the snow's all gone, and the soil's too wet to prep the soil for your continuous corn, and you've got another month or two in the springtime for the vetch to grow and get into growth, and you do something like that, you can cut your nitrogen application by 50%, make some more money, pollute the water tables a little bit less and, and uh, in, start improving your, your soils with that green body um, cover crop uh, uh, to rot your corn stover. It sounds like the best place for people to go to learn about about the the way that you're farming is really to dig in and, and just start to do it themselves and observe what goes on. And try a little patch. You know, you're a real farmer. Just try a little patch. Experiment. Pay attention. Open your mind up to the possibilities nature has to offer us. And if you have youngsters, um, uh, send them out here. Or sign up for my 90-day uh, program to get a lecture every day of uh, at least two hours for me or one of my support people. And, and you learn how to work in the morning, and, and you've got your chores. And, um, and uh, it's a great, great uh, opportunity. I have very many successful students throughout the nation. Bob, thank you again so much for sharing your time and your expertise with us today. This has been fantastic. You got it, buddy. All right. So wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 13 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast and that you can find the notes for this show at farmer to farmer podcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for canard. That's canard, C-A-N-N-A-R-D. Thank you to everyone who has taken the time to leave a rating or review. The more fresh comments we get, the higher it drives the show and the iTunes ratings, which really does make a difference in how many people this show reaches. You can leave a review on your computer by going to itunes.farmertofarmerpodcast.com and clicking on the blue view and iTunes button. That'll get you on the way. If you like what you hear, think about signing up for my newsletter, The Flying Rutabaga, at farmertofarmerpodcast.com or purplepitchfork.com. And take some time to noodle around that purplepitchfork.com website. I think we've got some good tools and resources there that I've, I, well, I've just gotten some good feedback about it. I'd like everybody to know that, that that's there. And one more thing, if you've hung on this long, I'd like to know what questions you, my listener, have that my guests or I might be able to answer in the podcast. Please let me know on Facebook at Purple Pitchfork or use the contact page on farmer to farmer podcast.com. Anything about farming and farm life is fair game. And if you want to be anonymous, just let me know and I won't mention your name on the air. If we choose your question to use on air, I'll even send you a farmer to farmer podcast mug. Thank you so much for listening and I hope you have a great day. Keep the tractor running.